Are any of you guys volunteering for this thing? This um, American Mathematical Society meeting? Were you asked to volunteer for it? Is that what they did? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're a second class undergrad. <laughs> well, you should all go to all of these things. It's a uh, <laughs> one, one reason is that there's so many things that we should have people going to all of them. And so at least try going to some of these things. Um, so today we have the usual seminar in this room. It's going to be at 2. So those of you who teach at 3, this is your chance to make it to a combinatoric seminar. But then you can't make it to the colloquium at 3. So. Um, so this is going to be a, a nice, fun combinatorics talk, and this is going to be a nice talk about billiards that looks really cool, actually. I don't know if you guys went to, there was another talk about billiards a few weeks ago, which was very interesting. It was a, it's a different person, but similar topic. And then you should go support your fellow grad students who are showing their work at this showcase of the College of Science and Engineering. So, so that's that. And then this is a really good opportunity. So, I, so there's a meeting of the American Mathematical Society, and it's right on this campus, so that's kind of a handy thing. You don't have to go very far. Um, Saturday and Sunday, all day long, and that's uh, here and in Hensel Hall, different rooms all over the place. There's, there's several sessions, uh, all kinds of talks going on. There's maybe 10 talks at any given time, so probably whatever kind of mathematics interests you the most, there's going to be good talks for you. And in particular, there's two talks, there's two sessions that um, that are relevant to the things that we've been doing in this class. So I'm, I'm organizing one session, which is called Matrix in Algebra and Geometry. Um, and there's another session that Matt Beck is organizing on, I think it's called uh, Number Theory on Polytopes, something like that. So I think they, they will be great, actually. So try to go to these things. And if anybody has any good ideas on how to get to campus on Sunday at 8 in the morning, if you're from out of town, let me know, because BART doesn't run that early. So so, so if, you, if you want to go to this, what you should do is, can someone just Google this and tell me what website to, to go to? But then you can come here, and there's going to be a program, and there's just like tons and tons and tons of talks. So um, probably. AMS.org. AMS. The whole word meetings? Yeah. No, It's kind of scary that I knew that it wasn't supposed to be the whole word. If you, if you go here, can you, do you get somewhere? I mean, if you click this, does it, does it go there? So, so go there or just come to campus and there will be little pamphlets. Anyway, you guys know how to Google stuff. Okay, so we are talking about cellular resolutions, right? So we did this kind of generally and now we want to do it concretely. So we talked about two kinds of resolutions last time. I guess, I guess three kinds, but the two most important ones were the Taylor resolution, which we said was good for any monomial ideal. So it had the advantage that it's very good, that it works for any monomial ideal, and the disadvantage that it's too big. Remember? Um, and then I was showing you this permutahedron resolution, which only works for permutation ideals. Um, okay. 
So we, I showed you this example of the permutahedron. I mean, basically, we spent a lot of time talking about the permutahedron, right? So this is the, poly, the polytope whose vertices correspond to the permutations of, of the numbers in your, in your vector right here. Okay, so that, for example, this thing is the permutahedron of 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Um, did I state the theorem, or did I, did I get so caught up that I didn't state it? So the, the theorem I meant to state is that the permutahedron gives a cellular resolution of the permutation ideal. Well, let me just write, write this out. So permutahedron. P of U supports a cellular resolution of the permutation ideal I of U. That's the main theorem of about permutahedron resolutions. And I didn't prove this, um, but what I'm going to do is that I'm going to show you a more general theorem today, and then I'll give you an indication of how to prove that thing. Okay. So, that's what we will talk about today. We will talk about something called Hall resolutions. And this Hall resolution is basically what you get when you try to do the permutahedron construction, but not just for a permutation ideal, but for any ideal. Okay. So we said that the Taylor resolution was a very cheap way of getting a resolution for any monomial ideal where you don't work very hard, and that means that you get an answer that is maybe not so handy because it's too long. So what we're going to do today is we're going to work a little bit harder and that way we're going to get a resolution for any monomial ideal, and it's going to be a shorter resolution, a much shorter resolution. Okay. Um, so how does this go? Maybe I'll just remind you of something that I, I showed last time that As long as the coordinates of u are different from each other, let's say that they are, they don't even need to be in, in this order. If u1 up to un are distinct, then the faces of the permutahedron p of u correspond to the ordered partitions of n. It's the set of numbers from 1 up to n. Okay. And so this is something interesting already that you should notice. Uh, what I'm saying here is that, you know, the permutahedron depends on, on two things. It depends on n, the dimension that you're talking about, and it also depends on the vector, u1 up to un. And of course, if you, if you change u, you are going to change your permutahedron. But what this tells you is that if you change u, you're not really going to change the facial structure of the permutahedron. Okay? Because you still are going to have a face corresponding to each order partition. Okay? So as, as u changes, the, per, the permutahedron changes, but the combinatorics doesn't change. Okay? So let me write that. As u varies, the combinatorics of the permutahedron doesn't. As long as your your u's are distinct. Okay? So for example, what I'm saying is that if you if n is equal to three, then every permutahedron is a hexagon. Or if n is equal to 4, then every permutahedron looks the same. And I kind of wanted to draw it, but I forgot. 
Um, I told you where to look at it. So, but but if, you, if you do it for n equals 4, then any permutahedron is going to have 24 vertices. It's going to have faces that are all either hexagons or, or rectangles. Okay. So the combinatorics doesn't change. Maybe the shape gets distorted, but, but the combinatorics is the same. That's what I'm saying here. Okay. So this is something good to keep in mind for the following discussion. So what is this Hall resolution? What I'm going to do is this. Well, let's start with any monomial ideal. Okay. And I'm going to do the following. And it, it's a little bit crazy to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to define the following thing. I'm going to define P sub T to be the convex hull of the following set. So this depends on a, on a, on a fixed number T. What I'm going to do is that whenever x1 to the a1 up to xn to the an lives in my ideal, I'm going to consider the point t to the a1 up to t to the an. And then I'm going to take the convex hull of all those points. Think about this for a second. This is, this is really kind of a crazy thing to do, right? Because this, this ideal has infinitely many monomials. Right? We have kind of some minimal monomials, and then everything bigger than those monomials is also in the ideal. For every single element of my infinite ideal, I get a point. And this point is constructed in some way. And then I'm taking the convex hull of those points. And so what I'm doing here is taking a convex hull of infinitely many points. Have you ever seen that before? That, that could go bad. I mean, for, for example, that could not be a polytope, because if you take the convex hull of the points on a circle, on a, on a, then you're going to get the whole disk. Okay. If you take the convex hull of infinitely many points, you could get any convex body. Um, so in principle, this could get pretty bad. But it turns out that actually it doesn't get so bad. And uh, maybe what we can do is do this for, let's do it for the, for the permutation ideal. Okay. So let me, OK, so, so what am I saying? What does this thing look like? Um, I don't know, is it for i of 1, 2, and 3, just to make our life a little bit simpler? So what are some of the things that, that live in this piece of T? Well, for example, this guy lives in the ideal. Right? So because this guy lives in the ideal, that means that I need to put down a point of, with coordinates t, comma, t squared, comma, t cubed. <coughs> And I can, I can permute the exponent to see that actually I need to get ev any permutation of these guys. Right? So for example, I need to get t cubed, t, t squared, all the permutations of, of these guys. Okay? So that means that at least I have, I have six 
distinguish points here, which are um, basically the permutahedron of t, t squared, and t cubed. Now, I just told you that any permutahedron for n equals 3 is a hexagon. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of use the same picture. And my picture is now going to be distorted if I want a really accurate description. But it's still going to look something like this. Okay. So far. I mean, uh, there are many more things in P sub t. But at least I have the points t, t squared, t cubed, etc. Okay. And so now I want you to imagine that when I, when I put 1, 2, 3 here, this is really what I'm calling 1, 2, 3 is really representing the point t, comma, t squared, comma, t cubed, etc. Okay. So 1, 3, 2 is what t, t cubed, t squared. So I have these six points. In my in my polytope, okay. But uh, but that's not it, because for example, um, I can multiply this thing by x, x squared, y squared, z cubed is also in my ideal. So that means that I need to put in the point t squared t squared, t cubed in p sub t. Okay. So I have these six points, but I also have to have one, I also have to have two, two, three. And I have to figure out where I'm supposed to draw this. Or for example, So, so where is 2, 2, 3 in this picture? 2, 2, 3 is kind of, if you, if you, if you, this is t, t squared, t cubed. And now to go to t squared, t squared, t cubed, I need to kind of move in this way to make my y coordinate bigger. Okay. Um, let me show you another example. For example, t, t squared, t to the fourth also needs to live here. And, the, and where does that live? Well, that's kind of right above the point 1, 2, t, t squared, t cubed. There should be a point t, t squared, t to the fourth, and t, t squared, t to the fifth, t, t squared, to t to the sixth, etc. So all of these points I get to, I should also put in. Okay. And yeah, so this is like 1, 2, 4, and 1, 2, 5, and the distances get bigger because this is t cubed, height t cubed, height t to the fourth, height to the t to the fifth, etc. Of course, this picture is not really drawn to scale. But you see, the point is once, once this guy is in the ideal, then everything above it is in the ideal. Okay? Which means that, I, that in P sub. So this picture now is not P of 1, 2, 3, it's P sub t. Right? And in P sub t, I need to throw all of this stuff in. And, and for the same reason, I need to throw this stuff in. I want to try to draw this picture fairly well. So, um, Now, because these guys are in, now if, if I move up my x-coordinate, then that should also be in. right? So that means that all of these guys should be in piece of t. Right? Here's 1, 3, 3, 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 5, et cetera. And these guys should also live in piece of t. Okay. And if you and if you look at this picture carefully, you'll see that that's that that's it basically. All of these points, these infinitely many points that I wrote down, they're actually all inside this polyhedron. Okay. So I'm taking a, a convex hull of infinitely many points, but most of these points are kind of interior to it and don't really contribute to the convex to make the convex hull bigger. So in this example, the P sub t is an open polyhedron that has, you know, the hexagon here. I mean, can, can you see it? Can you, can you see how it goes? It kind of has a hexagon, and then it has like a flap like this, a flap like this, and a flap like this, and then it's kind of look, looking towards you. What about like 1, 3, 4? Can you go up from 
What about 134? So 134 would start at 132 and you would move the z coordinate. So it would be like up here. And 134 would be on this phase right here. Wait, 134 would be maybe. I mean, it's, if I start putting more pictures in here, it's going to get really confusing. But 134 is on, on this phase. Yeah. yeah, this is a phase. Right, so this, this is, I mean, this is a, a wall in the direction xz, a wall in the direction yz, and a wall in the direction xy. So this thing has uh, six infinite walls and one finite wall, one bounded wall. That's what this picture looks like. So that's that's this thing piece of T that I'm that I'm considering. So, so it turns out this wasn't so crazy after all, because basically what you what what we're doing is, you know. We're saying, okay, the generators are the really important guys. And then if you're standing on a generator, then of course everything above you should go in. Everything in that direction should go in. Everything in that direction should go in. But basically it's, it's just starting at the generators, all the stuff that's further out has to be in. Okay. So here's some facts that show that this is not such a big deal. So the first fact is that this thing really is a polyhedron. Second fact is that what I just said. So are you considering that T is an indeterminate that can have any value? So, so for example, if T is one, what's so it's a very good point. So T is an indeterminate that I'm, I want to assume it's bigger than one. So that so that this T T squared T cube actually grow. If t was equal to 1, then this would be a really boring polytope. And, and if t was less than 1, then things would kind of cluster into the origin. And actually, I don't It might be that that's still polyhedral, but I'm not sure. OK, pt is a polyhedron. It is, so let me say what the other thing I said, which is that it's basically, by the way, let me, let me give a name to this stuff. So I'm just going to call this thing t to the a, okay. so, so t is a real number and a is a vector. Right? And this we've always called vector x to the vector a. Okay. So the next thing I want to say is that p sub t is what you get when you take the convex hull of these points, but now I only consider the generators. So maybe I'll call it min of i. And what I mean by this is the set of generators of i. Remember, we, we know that those generators are unique because this is a monomial ideal. Okay. And basically, this plus everything, everything further out. That's what this means. You can start in any of these guys and and just look at anything where, where the coordinates are bigger, and that'll be fine. Okay. Now, here's the next statement, which is a which is a very nice statement, or a very useful statement. Um, and I think it's I think it's actually a good statement to talk about. Why? I mean, I, I, I told you that I was going to generalize permutation ideals, right? So why did I take t to the a1 up to t to the a n as the coordinates when for the permutation ideal, I wasn't doing that, right? For the permutation ideal, if I had x, y squared, z cubed in the permutation ideal, then I put 1, 2, 3. But now all of a sudden, I'm changing the rules, and instead of putting the, the exponents, I'm putting t to the, the exponents. Okay. The reason is this. Um, here we have this theorem that if u1 up to un are distinct, then basically the combinatorics is, is determined. Okay. And 
this gets much uh, this gets troublesome here. Okay? And if you want this to work for any monomial ideal, then this doesn't work, and what you have to do is this. And, this, and the analogous statement is that the combinatorial structure of P sub T um, doesn't depend on T. It doesn't depend on T for T greater than, so this is just kind of a technical condition. Because actually, the combinatorics does depend on t until t is large enough that then it doesn't. Okay, so, so if you choose smaller values of t and you do this construction, then you might get things that look very different from each other. But if you choose any really large t, and by really large, I mean greater than n plus 1 factorial, then you're always going to see the same combinatorics in that picture. So that's kind of the analogous statement of, of the permutahedron. Um, what else do I want to say? What I what I want to the next thing I want to say is that actually, if you want the vertices of of this polytope, then they're exactly these ones that I wrote. The vertices of this polyhedron. Sorry. Remember, you have to call it a polyhedron if it's if we don't know that it's bounded. The vertices of PT are precisely the points T to the A such that X to the A is, a gener is one of the generators. Okay. Which again is, wh is what I'm saying, what we're seeing here in this example. Okay, this is some, some uh, unbounded polyhedron which has exactly six vertices. And the six vertices are exactly corresponding to the to the generators of the ideal. Okay. So definition the Hall complex of I is the polyhedral complex. that I get from taking PT and throwing out all the things that are unbounded and keeping only the things that are bounded. Which is what I want to do in this example, right? I, if we start with the permutation ideal, then I only want to keep this hexagon. I only want to keep the bounded part. And I throw out everything else. Okay. And so that's what I want to do here also. The whole complex is the polyhedral complex of bounded faces of PT. And this comes naturally labeled with vertices with so the vertices come naturally labeled by the minimal generators. Of I. Okay. And this is a really good thing because remember that we, if we want to find a cellular a cellular resolution of I, then we need a polyhedral complex whose vertices are the generators of I. And here we have it. We have a, a polyhedral complex, this thing called the Hall complex, and the vertices of this thing are exactly corresponding to the minimal generators. Okay. So, as an example, and now, again, the point is that the way that I define these things, they depend on T, but the combinatorics of this construction is not going to depend on T if you choose T 
be large enough. So, so we do that. So example, and by the way, this is, this is also relevant to, to Laura's question because Laura said, well, what happens if we choose t equals 1? If we choose t equals 1, then this does have different combinatorics. Right? If you choose t equals 1, you just have a single point. Why? Because 1 is too small. If you choose t less than 1, then also the combinatorics is different. But if you choose t large enough, then there's no dependence on t anymore. So for example, the whole complex of the permutation ideal I of u is just the permutahedron. So that's how this is a generalization of the permutahedron. And well, as you can imagine, because the subject of this section is Hall resolution, uh, the punchline is that this thing works. Right? This thing does give you a resolution. Um, so the theorem, the whole, the whole complex of I supports a free resolution. A cellular resolution. Remember, we denote like this of the ideal I. Now, one thing that I would like you to notice is that We started with something in m variables, right? So, so where does this polytope live? Well, but by definition, it's it's the convex hull of things that live in R n. So th this this thing naturally lives in R n. It's an n-dimensional polyhedral complex. So the length of the cellular resolution that you get here well we know that that's equal to the dimension of this polyhedral complex right. and this thing lives in n dimensions so that's less than or equal to n And this is this is really good news because if you if you're an ideal in n variables, then you can be resolved in n steps. Right? And uh, what we have here is a very concrete construction that always does that. This thing is. I mean, the other thing could be really really long, right? In the example of the permutahedron, the other thing took n factorial steps. This just takes n steps, and that's true for any monomial ideal. Okay. For any monomial ideal, you have to construct this whole resolution, which I agree is, is, is trickier, right? It, it takes, you look more confused today than, than you looked about the Taylor resolution. But we have to work harder if we want a better resolution, right? 
And this resolution is always of length less than or equal to n. It's, not, it's still not necessarily minimal, but at least we know that probably we're not off by so much. Okay. Okay. So, so maybe the next thing to do will be, let me just give you a, a sketch of how this goes. So how do you prove something like this? Um, trying to figure out what to erase. I think what I should do is just keep this here. So the whole complex cons um, consists of the bounded faces of this thing. Okay. So again, remember that. Uh, the nice thing about these cellular resolutions is that it's very concrete. You know exactly what you need to prove. What you need to prove is you choose any uh, vector b in n to the n. And you look at the subcomplex of faces, which are less than or equal to b component wise. Okay. And this should be acyclic. Okay. So this is what we need to show. How are we going to show it? We're going to show it as follows. What I'm going to do is Maybe before I show it, let, let's just look at an example of how this looks. So, I'm trying to think of what a good example could be. Um, so for example, we need we need to do it for b equals three, three, two. Right? This is one of the b's we have to check in this example. Um, So what does this guy look like? Well, we need to, again, you, you take this um, unbounded polyhedron, you throw out all the unbounded pieces, and you look at only at the bounded things. Okay. In this case, the bounded things are the six vertices, the six edges, and the hexagon. And you figure out which ones have labels less than or equal to 3, 3, 2. So what about the vertices? Well, the vertices. I guess these are the only two that give you a problem, right? Because these have third coordinate equal to three. And all of these guys live in, in this subcomplex. Right? Now, as for the two dimensional faces, well, the, the label of this two dimensional face is. 2, 3, 2, so that one is fine. This one is 3, 3, 1, so that's fine. This one is 3, 2, 2, so that's fine. And that's it, right? Because any phase that contains a 3 in the last coordinate is going to... 
sorry, any phase that contains one of these two vertices is going to contain a 3 in the last coordinate, so it's going to get thrown out. So the subcomplex of thing less than or equal to 3, 3, 2 looks like this. And we need to make sure that that thing has no homology, which, which it doesn't in this case, right? This thing can, can, can be contracted into a point. And this is what I want to do in general for any D. Okay. And what I'm going to do is the following. What I'm going to do is I'm about to produce for you a, a hyperplane. Right? I'm going to make a cut in this picture. And that hyperplane is going to leave that subcomplex on one side of the hyperplane and everything else on the other side. Well, it's going to get really hard to draw this, but I think I can do it. Um, so I, I need to slice my piece of T with a, with a plane that leaves exactly this on one of the sides. Okay? So it looks like my plane needs to look something like this. Maybe I should get rid of the green stuff. So you see that I make a brown slice. And if you look at the at the things that are on that side of the of my brown slice, you get exactly the complex of things less than or equal to three, three, two. And if you look at the things on this side, you get the other stuff. Okay. So this is what I'm about to pull off in that level of generality, not just for this picture. Okay. So how do I do that? Well, I'm just going to give you the equation of, of, the, of the hyperplane, and I'm going to show you that it works. So I claim this. Consider the hyperplane. given by the following equation. Um, I'm going to look at the things whose dot product with V. Sorry, I'm going to look at the Vs whose dot product with the vector T to the minus V is equal to N plus a little epsilon. And I'm going to consider a vertex a vertex of my polyhedron P sub T. But you see that this this brown thing is what you're supposed to think is is that hyperplane, right? This is has equation t to the minus b, which in this case is three three two dot v equals n in this case is three because we're in three dimensions plus epsilon. And epsilon is just some tiny number that you choose zero point zero zero one whatever. So I claim that this hyperplane is going to do the trick. Okay. So I take a vertex of piece of T, and I'm going to show So first of all, if this vertex is in my sub in my subcomplex of things less than or equal to B. then that means that A is less than or equal to B component wise, by definition, right? So let's, let's compute this. What do you get when you take the dot product of T to the minus B and T to the A? 
Well, the first coordinate of this thing is t to the minus b1. The first coordinate of this thing is t to the a1. Then the, you get the same thing for all of these other guys. Right. Now, a is less than or equal to b in every coordinate, right? And that means that a1 minus b1 is negative, and t to a negative number is less than 1, right? Each one of these things is, is t to some negative number, so that can't be more than 1. So this is less than n. So what I showed is that if t to the a is in the subcomplex that you're trying to pick out, then it's on, it's on one side of the hyperplane. It's on the side where you are less than n plus epsilon. Now, what if, you're, what if this is not the case? If this is not the case, then it's not true that a is less than or equal to b component-wise. So some ai is strictly greater than some bi. And when you do this computation again, you get a bunch of summons, one of which is t to the ai minus bi. Now these things are integers, right? The a's and the b's, they're exponents, so they're integers. So if this is a positive integer, it's at least 1, which means that this is greater than t, greater than or equal to t. Okay? But then remember, the nice thing is that we chose t to be very large. t is larger than n plus 1 factorial. And if it's larger than n plus 1 factorial, then for sure, it's larger than n plus epsilon. Okay. And so you see when I'm, I'm just kind of doing this computation that says, if you are on one side of the hyperplane, then I want you in my subcomplex. If you're on the other side of my hyperplane, I don't want you in my subcomplex. So, so what I did is exactly what I said I was going to do. Okay. Now, why is this good? This is good because I'm going to define Q to be the part of P sub T which is on the correct side of the hyperplane. I don't know. Um, let's call this hyperplane H. Okay. And I'm going to consider the points in my polytope that are on the correct side, on the, on the less than side. Okay. So I'm going to, right, so what do I get in this case? Something like this. I don't know if I can do this. That's okay. So, so this is my polytope Q, the one from that example, right? And and H is well, it's a little unfortunate that H is covering everything here. So I'm about to shade H, and it's going to cover the whole picture, right? But H is the brown hyperplane, right? So H is. H is that brown hyperplane, and I'm going to call P the intersection of PT with H. So P is going to be this brown, this brown face. It's one of the facets of this hyperplane. Okay. Then what I have here. 
This is a facet. A facet of Q. And then my subcomplex that I want, basically, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, what you want to keep is all the faces that don't touch the brown face. In this case, what do you want? Well, everybody touches the brown face except for this stuff back here, which is exactly what we're looking for. And all the other faces share something with the brown face. Okay? So this thing is the subcomplex of faces not touching of faces of Q not touching P. Okay. And then, if you want to show that this is acyclic, then basically, I mean, at some point you have to do some topology. And the topology that you do is that you prove that for any polytope Q and every facet P, if you look at the subcomplex of faces of Q that don't touch P, that's contractible, which I hope looks, I hope sounds reasonable, right? You take a polytope, you take one of its facets, and you're basically saying that the other stuff that doesn't touch that facet doesn't have any holes. I hope that sounds reasonable at least. It takes a proof, but you prove it. You can see the proof in, in the miller stormfeld book. So that gives you a, a sketch of why this whole, whole complex works. Okay. Now, maybe the, the, the last thing that I will mention is that you can actually draw this whole complex as being part of P. And uh, maybe I'll just, say, I'll just say this. If I contains... I don't know, x1 to the a1 up to xd to the ad. Basically, what you have is a point on each one of the coordinate axes. Okay. And so the way this picture looks is like this. Where you get this stuff back, this stuff over here, and then you're gonna get some polytope that lives in here. It's, it's good if you if you do an example to see how how this goes. Um, so the whole complex 